the mind and brain are connected, but the scientific data doesn't enable you to establish the nature of that connection or the relationship. Just because science can't demonstrate that physical processes and mental processes are the same thing, that in and of itself doesn't give you any evidence that that's not the case either. Some people talk about seeing deceased relatives and communicating with them. This idea of floating up out of your body and watching things happen and being able to describe it afterwards, that could be formed in your imaginative mind. Conscious experience and brain processes are two fundamentally different things. I wonder if we're talking Would about... Would you like me to go out for a bit? You guys seem really <laughs> happy. <laughs> If you want more from today's conversation, register now and you'll receive the e-book of Sharon Dirks and Ian McGilchrist debating brain science and God. And also, tell us who persuaded you in our survey with today's show. Hello and welcome to the big conversation from Premier Unbelievable, brought to you in partnership with the John Templeton Foundation. I am your host, Andy Kind. The Big Conversation is all about having large chats, sprawling chats about those big issues around faith, science, philosophy and culture, bringing together some of the brightest and most ardent thinkers across the belief spectrum. Today we are discussing the brain, consciousness and near-death experiences. Are NDEs proof of an afterlife? In an age where opinion is very much divided on the nature of consciousness and the human mind, or soul, if there even is one, or if even that's a proper term to use, might NDEs provide proof of an afterlife? Should we give them credence as supporting evidence? Or do we just need to accept that once it's the end of the brain, it's the end of the game? Well, Joining me today to definitively answer this question are two illustrious and distinguished guests, Sharon Dirks and Emily Kureshi Hurst. Welcome. Thank Hi. you. We've got a lot to talk about, but what I wanted to do was start gently and just get your background and backstories uh, a little bit. You are both academics, both doctors. So could you talk about your route into your chosen subject and how your worldview has changed or influenced where you've got to at this current state. So Sharon, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, so I, I guess I, I began life, uh, well, um, my, my earliest childhood memories, I, I didn't really have a particular beliefs uh, about, about the world. I, I remember um, as a child, um, having a thought as I was just sort of sitting watching the rain uh, splash against the pane one day being slightly bored I I remember a series of thoughts coming into my head why can I think why do I exist why am I a living breathing conscious being now the thing that's helpful to know uh, about me at that point was that I, I wasn't raised in a religious home and so those thoughts were seemingly coming from a kind of neutral uh, vantage point on life um, and I suppose later on I began to absorb a what you call materialistic uh, perspective from you know the news from books from the views of my friends from radio and tv and so on um, I knew that I was a, a scientist from quite early on I decided to continue in the sciences from from my teenage years um, and um, I remember my A-level biology teacher handing me a copy of um, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, and um, this was a long time ago, and so this book was fairly hot off the press, and I remember reading this book and um, this view that we are essentially material beings in a material world, and, and not really questioning it, just kind of absorbing it, um, and it wasn't really until I arrived at university that I began to really think about whether there was more to to it than that. And yeah, I essentially arrived at, at university with the, the view that um, God didn't exist um, and that being a credible scientist was certainly not compatible mm. with belief in God. That's really interesting. Isn't yeah. It? So what then changed for you? What was the what was the crossing the Jordan moment for you? Well, I wouldn't say there was a moment. I would say there were there was a process with certain kind of key moments along the way. Um, 
uh, in my very first week, I was invited to an event called Gorilla Christian, which has not, nothing to do with barbecuing, as we know. Um, but there were Christians uh, who you could address questions to one evening. So I went along and I um, spent the evening listening to other people's questions. And then about halfway through, I plucked up courage to ask my own question and asked, surely you can't believe in God and be a credible scientist at the same time. And was actually told, you know, something along the lines of one of the things we're discussing today, which is that these are both ways of looking at the same reality, mm. but just from different perspectives. And and that, of course, you don't need to choose. It's like asking someone to choose between um, the existence of Jeff Bezos and the programming and processing mm. languages underneath uh, undergirding Amazon. Yeah. Of course, you don't need to choose between those two things. And together, they give a more complete picture of reality. Well, this for me opened up a whole um, vista. I thought, well, okay, if there's a persuasive, credible answer to that question, how many other responses are there out there um, that m might be able to help me in my journey? So I spent the next 18 months grilling a lot more Christians, asking a lot more questions, and eventually, and including about the person of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and eventually became uh, persuaded, not that I had every question answered, and I still don't, uh, there's, there's a lot of mystery there, but that I, I became convinced that Jesus was real, that he had risen from the dead, and that he loved me, and I was actually going to flourish most as a human being in a relationship with him. And so I actually changed my views upon, uh, about God in my 20s, well, at the age of 20, Fantastic. studying biochemistry. Yeah, and that, that was point. just a couple of months ago, wasn't it? So, uh, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> but yes. that's great. So you came to this conclusion that science and religion are not at war don't have to be. It's not a turf war. They can both live quite happily in the neighbourhood. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Well, well, we'll talk about that more. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. First time. Yep. So do you want to give your backstory? Yeah, so... Um, don't start from birth. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll start a little bit after birth Just then. the highlights. Yeah. Um, so I come from a sort of Christian family. We have Christian grandparents. My granddad was a priest, so I spent a fair bit of time as a child in church and Sunday school, I was always exposed to the Christian religion, but it didn't really seem to resonate very deeply with me. But I was, I was always interested in it as a perspective, as a worldview, uh, but it just, I've, I, I didn't connect with it. I didn't think that it was true. Um, and then my dad always used to talk to me about the universe and he was really interested in science. So I think actually from a very early age, I was raised in an environment where both science and religion were seen as fascinating mm. ways of understanding the world. So I came to, I went to Oxford to study philosophy and theology. And to prepare myself for that, I read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. So he features in my story as well. Mm. And I was totally convinced that he was absolutely right. I mean, the, the mind of a 17 year old is very black and white. So mm. I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. And I came to, came to university. And very early on when I was there, I think in my first term, Richard Dawkins did a talk at the Union. I was like, oh, great, chance to meet him. So I went and I got to talk to him. And um, I, got to, I asked him, because I was studying theology, and in his book he says theology, something along the lines of theology isn't a real discipline. Mm. Or, you know. And I said to him, you know, I am an atheist. I agree with a lot of the stuff you say, but I'm here studying theology. You've said it's not a real discipline. Can you respond? And he couldn't really. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time that I saw this kind of new atheist world for you start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there on, I've been interested in basically the intersection between philosophy, theology and physics yeah. and trying to look at all of the different ways that these can interact. I, I no longer think science and religion are incompatible, cool. although I am an atheist. So I do think religion is false, yeah. but I find it fascinating. So I'm... Yeah, ever since then, I've been researching and learning more about science, religion and philosophy. That's fantastic. Well, it's great that we've got two academics who are coming at it from a different perspective. Mm. But again, we are not in some kind of pitched battle here. So let's talk, first of all, about the, the areas of convergence. Where do the two Venn diagrams overlap? You don't think that they're in incompatible? No, I don't, no. Do you think that with science, you would say that religion religious belief is is incorrect is flawed so how do you then compare that to science is science simply a best guess of what we've got and what we know about the universe or would you would you dig down a bit deeper into certainty with with science and how does that how do those two magisteria 
converge in your mind? Mm, it's a very good question. But I think before I answer it, we need to take a step back one, what take one step back and really think about what we actually mean by the terms science and religion. Mm. We use them all the time with certain assumptions about what they mean, but actually when you start to unpick those definitions of science and religion, the conceptual categories start to fall apart, or at least they start to fray at the edges. So let's start with religion. What, what do we mean when we say religion? In the West, we typically think of religion as a system of beliefs, particularly surrounding belief in God, uh, but of course that doesn't capture all types of religion. Right. There are certain religions that aren't organized around a particular God or gods. Mm -hmm. There are also religions that aren't primarily determined or shaped by belief. There are religions that are shaped by community, by practice, by ritual. So when we start to dig down into what religion really is, we realize maybe it's a family of things, maybe it's a, a category that we can't actually draw neat boundaries around. Mm -hmm. So that's my that's the first thing I'd like to say. And then with science, it's it's also the same. We also have conceptual problems there. So do we think of science as a body of knowledge? Mm -hmm. And if we do, what knowledge is included and what knowledge is excluded? There's always disputes between scientists, rightly so, about different interpretations of data. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not as clear to me to say that science is a body of knowledge and that's it. So one of the other definitions is that science is a methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the methodologies of science are multifarious. So the way that you do geology and the way that you do quantum mechanics are completely different. So I think we also need to be really careful when we use the term science that we're being really careful and clear mm -hmm. about what we mean by it. So, and the way that we define these two terms massively goes on to shape how we think that their relationship should go. So if you think of religion as a system of beliefs mm -hmm. and science as a body of knowledge, then you can look at the beliefs and the body of knowledge and see, okay, well, they seem to hit up against each other and we seem to have areas of incompatibility. If you see science as a methodology, a way of coming to understand the world, and religion as a set of rituals and community-based things, then they can't really talk to each other at all. Mm -hmm. So that's a long and maybe quite fluffy answer, <laughs> but I think it really, really matters how we define these terms and what we think of when we're using them, and, and that will inform how we understand their relationship. Well, we're all about long-form answers here, so you, you take Great. your time. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you're in the right place, Emily. Uh, Sharon, do you want to respond to that? Mm -hmm. Is it too simplistic to say that science and religion, obviously vague terms, um, is it too simplistic to say that science is about mechanism and religion is about meaning? Is that too vague? I mean, I think is there are, churlish, there are to say different that? layers and levels at which you can respond to the question. Um, I definitely agree with Emily in the sense that there are many different ways in which we uh, approach the sciences. There are many different religions. And we might find it you know, more helpful in our discussion to focus on theology um, mm -hmm. as opposed to religion. Mm -hmm. There's a question as to, you know, because there are so many different kinds of religion, do they all lend themselves to the practice of science in the same way that the Judeo-Christian framework does? And I think there's a whole conversation mm. to be had there about the uniqueness of Judeo-Christianity in the very fact that it um, enables the sciences to proceed and historically has kind of, an, um, kind of paved the way for mm. that. Um, but I, uh, I guess in its broader sense, if we're thinking about definitions, um, I see um, the sciences and theology both as an exploration of reality. They're ways of exploring what is real and true in the world. And as Einstein put it, you know, uh, a scientist is a seeker after truth. What is true mm. in the world, whether that is in the natural world or in the spiritual realm, if, if indeed there is one. Um, and so I, that's why I, I would take the view that they are. I, I really like um, Alistair McGrath's uh, view of mutual enrichment, that mm. actually they're both looking at the same reality and therefore we, it, doesn't, it doesn't help us to separate them off from each other and see, see them as different categories, um, even if that lends some credence to the existence and credibility of theological perspectives, I think that they should be seen as overlapping because they both describe the same reality but from different perspectives. And I know that um, you know the philosopher Mary Midgley mm. talks about these um, maps of meaning. You know, if we want to look at a map of the UK, we could look at it from you know, we could look at a political map in terms of like the the political positions of people around the country, or we could look at a religious map of uh, people and their religious beliefs, or we could look at an economic map, or um, you know, uh, all kinds of different ways. And no one um, of those 
maps is um, a kind of a conclusive summary of the country as a whole Mm -hmm. but you gain greater understanding by layering them again you know one on top of the other and with the addition of each one you gain more insight into the UK and what it what it's like as a country and that's how I see the interaction of theology and um, uh, and the sciences that together they give a more complete picture of reality Um, yeah and presumably you would say that they're in that respect they're both they're both true aren't they they're both i mean you were as a christian they're have, both means of exploring what is true yeah. in the world yeah. and 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 i guess well what's interesting about what we'll get to today that it seems to be that could there be that there are kind of spiritual aspects of the world that we can observe within a scientific context which is what's kind of fascinating about near-death experiences yeah, that's that another we're... area of deep overlap i mean we've got so much to come we're going to talk about the mind we're going to talk about near-death experiences for you then emily as someone um who is a, a, an atheist but also a very humble and cogent writer and not disinterested at all in theology your book is called god salvation and the problem of space time so mm. it's about the intersectionality isn't it of 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 these things where would you say is the is the is the greatest sort of uh, conflict between theology and science is is there is there an impasse at some point where you think you know what at this point we we do need to we do need to separate the two yeah um so i think it the conflict lies in um trying to think of the right term, fundamentalist religion or biblical mm. literalism, taking the particularly the creation narratives mm. in Genesis as uh, factually and historically accurate. The type of, um, of Christianity that takes those as mm. the final word on matters of history is not compatible with science. So young earth creationism um, or a denial of evolution. I mean, they're, at that point, science and religion are coming into conf- conflict with each other in a way that can't really be resolved mm. because the two sides the science and the religion are um they're starting from completely different points and so there isn't really a place where there isn't a common framework by which you can assess the claims that each are making if religion rejects the findings of science if that form of religion rejects the findings of science then you can't use the scientific method to say well hang on we've got really good evidence that the earth isn't six thousand years old and that animals did evolve and humans did evolve as well so i think that's where there could be some potential well definite conflict but you don't have to interpret the bible that way so the conflict absolutely isn't necessary but there are areas of conflict that are present, yeah. for sure. Mm. So is this idea of a fundamental turf war, these two old firm enemies going at it hand and tooth, is that quite a modern invention, do you think, Sharon? Um, I, I think that it, it, it may have... Uh, I think it probably is uh, quite a, a recent phenomenon. Um, in terms of my own story, I, I um, actually one of the things that was kind of keeping me from and that concerned me about any exploration of the Christian faith was that I was going to be asked to kind of turn my back on the kinds mm. of things that I was learning about in, in studying biochemistry um, and specifically the question of evolution. And of course, it was it, it was a great relief to me to, to hear. Actually, one of my bi- biochemistry lecturers uh, was a Christian. Um, and <clears throat> the church that I ended up becoming involved with, he, he was a member of that church. And it was, you know, really helpful to hear that there are thinking Christians that that hold different views on mm. on the age of the earth and indeed the mechanisms through which kind of um, well cosmological evolution and biological evolution took place. Now there's a whole conversation around. You talked about definitions earlier. What do we mean by evolution? I mean that's a, a vast term, um, and how it distinguishes from evolutionism, which is what we see in a lot of scientific literature where people are using a, a kind of um, a naturalistic evolutionarily naturalistic worldview to interpret scientific data that doesn't necessarily go there that's a whole conversation but stepping back from that you know christians can hold all kinds of views and theistic evolution as you know is one of them Mm -hmm. that actually 
um, the opening chapters of Genesis are not a scientific textbook, were never intended mm. to be about the how long ago and by what means did mm. God create the, the world that we see around us. In fact, they're about the who uh, of creation. If you look at the, the kind of surrounding context, it was polytheism, um, where there were belief that you know nature was itself divine and the author of genesis is trying to say no actually the, the heavenly bodies are not themselves deities uh, god is distinct from nature but yet made the material world and it's that god that i'm trying to make clear to you and so the the days of genesis are not um you know commented on in terms of how long they are in fact there mm. are parts of the bible that say a day to the lord is like a thousand years mm. a thousand years are like a day and and so they could be six evolutionarily long periods of time in which what we now you know know to be seem to be have observed naturally that evolutionary processes could take place during those days and mm. there are many christians that hold that view as, as well as Christians that might say we're going to accept cosmology and geology but we also believe there were still supernatural processes as well as natural processes involved that would be old earth creationism and then of course you mentioned young earth but there are a variety of views and people discuss and debate um, I personally uh, I, I do I do feel that we need to um, you know accept and and then these precisely because it's important to have dialogue between scientists and theologians scientists that have done hard work and uh, you know have drawn conclusions about the natural world well theologians and the, um, religious communities ought to listen to that and respect each other's discipline that's absolutely yeah absolutely fantastic and we're going to go on to talk about the mind and the brain and the relationship between the two we're going to talk about near-death experiences but what I think is great is to have this foundation of uh, cozy collusion if you like and both of you coming at it from different worldviews you are both curious you would both agree I think that in order to do what both of you do you need to have a belief in the intelligibility of, of the universe and also uh, a curiosity mm -hmm. so none of this is again what we're sort of eschewing here and what we're sort of rejecting is that very binary approach of it's either completely black or it's either completely mm. white it is one or it is mm. zero there is a venn diagram where we can have these um great intersections we're going to go into a, a break in in a while but let's just start let's just sort of open up and we can drill down into this after the the break about the brain and the mind mm. <laughs> Emily, what is the mind? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. And uh, philosophers have been thinking about this uh, as long as there have been philosophers, I think. Um, I may Maybe we should talk about some different positions that you can have on the relationship between the may mind and the brain. Maybe we should, at you some know, point. But on I, reflection. I am a sceptic about the our ability to know for sure. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think I'm going to remain agnostic mm -hmm. on some of the issues about the relationship between the mind and the brain. But I'm certainly rejecting dualism. dualism. Okay. I don't think there is a brain and a mind and that these two can be completely separated uh, One can and one can live without the other. Mm -hmm. So I am some form of materialist, mm -hmm. I think, but whether I'm a reductive materialist or a non-reductive materialist, and we'll get into what those are, <laughs> yeah. um, I am not entirely sure. I, what I will say, though, before we get started, is that all positions have significant problems with them still, which is why no firm conclusions mm. have been reached. So uh, there's, there's lots to talk about with all of these different views and lots of objections we can discuss as well. Well, there's a whole buffet for you to get into after the break, Sharon, but we're going to have a, a, a little break now just to tantalise people are watching. You're both splendid. Thanks for that wonderful opening section. On The Big Conversation today, we are talking about the mind, consciousness and near-death experiences, our NDEs, proof of an afterlife. And my guests already having a, a wonderful time and a fascinating conversation are Sharon Dirix and Emily Kureshi Hurst. We will be back after this short break. Are you enjoying the conversation? Why don't you tell us who persuaded you in our survey? Plus, if you want more from today's conversation, register now and you'll receive the e-book of Sharon Dirix and Ian McGilchrist debating brain science and God. Welcome back to the big conversation with me, your host, Andy Kind. And today it's a great topic. We're talking about the mind, consciousness and near-death experiences, our NDEs, proof of an afterlife. And we've already had a fantastic conversation with our two guests, Sharon Dirix and Emily Kureshi Hurst. 
before the break, we got onto the massive, contentious potentially, subject of mind and brain dualism. And uh, we left you tantalizingly hanging, wanting to respond there, Sharon. Emily, you're saying that you reject the the dualism. You are... Absolutely. Ab- yeah. Absolutely. I'm a physicalist. You're yeah. a physicalist. And Slash materialist. Some sort of materialist. Um, yeah. What is your response to that, Sharon? But also, could you outline for us some of the ways that we mm. can think about mind and brain. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, it's worth kind of setting the scene a little bit. And the reason why we find ourselves talking about this is because, you know, the view exists out there that your neurons drive everything about you, Um, your personality, your choices, even your religious beliefs, you know, they're all dictated by the neurons in your head. Um, Is that the case? And is that the best story that can be told about what a human being is? Um, and so that led me to, you know, write a book, Am I Just My Brain? Um, and to think about this this question in more depth. And of course, we've already started to sort of dig in um, to this because we don't just have a brain, we also have a mind. Um, and the question, what is the mind, is, is another another thing along the way. And um, ultimately, you know, we, we don't just have a brain, we have neurons, um, chemicals, transmitters, and so on, but we also have a mind with its thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, and so on. In other words, um, there's something that it's like to be you. There's something that it's like to be me. Um, And how do you get from one to the other? And that is known as the mind-brain problem. How do you get from neurons in your head to what it's like to be you, the kind of inner life that we seem to have or the stream of consciousness that seems to be going all the time? And this is what Philip Ball described, because he's written a lot about the the mind, this aboutness, Mm. uh, reducing it to the idea that having a mind means that there is something it is like to be that thing yes and that's again yes seems a bit vague and 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 non-mathematical yes but is that the best we've got in terms of yes mind identity right and um and i suppose a reductive um physicalist at at its kind of sharpest end and i recognize there's a kind of a spectrum is essentially saying that mental states are brain states Mm -hmm. that uh, mental processes are brain processes which is kind of like saying there isn't something that it is like to be you. There's just brain activity um, at its sharpest edge. Now, of course, I know you want to respond to me on that, and there are different different ways of, of looking at it. But um, the reason why I'm not persuaded by that um, is... Uh, is to do with something what philosophers refer to as qualia. Mm. Um, so if um, if I were to ask you to describe to me, for example, the smell of coffee, yeah. um, and we just we all we have at our disposal are physical descriptions. Yeah. Well, you may offer me, you know, the chemical structure of caffeine, yeah. but that doesn't get you any closer to the smell of coffee. And the inner experience of joy and things like Right, that. as you drink it, depending yeah. on the level of your dependency, yes. Yeah, um, I am dependent on it. As am I. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that. Um, no, and, you know, you might describe the physiology as you digest it, but that doesn't get you any closer to the smell of coffee. If you want to understand the smell of coffee, you need to smell it. Uh, there's no way of capturing that experience physically in terms of physical descriptions. And this is why many philosophers, atheists and agnostics, as well as theists, argue that um, actually experience, conscious experience and brain processes are two very different things. And one does not capture the other, nor is one synonymous with the other. And so um, this is why uh, alternative ways of looking at the mind-brain relationship are needed because this doesn't capture the ultimate qualia of what it's like to be you as a person. And it's great, and there will be, we'll let you come back on that in a moment, Emily. And it's fantastic because although this is a very uh, gracious and charitable conversation, there is a lot at stake in, in your book, your most recent book, Am I Just My Brain? by uh, Sharon Dirick. That's, it's you. you say, we don't merely secrete brain chemicals, we also think thoughts. And we don't think with our brains, but with our minds. But what exactly is the mind and how does it relate to the brain? And herein lies the rub. 
Mm. Essayist Marilyn Robinson in her book Absence of Mind reads the situation well by pointing out that whoever controls the definition of the mind controls the definition of humankind itself. It's a bit like the Battle of Waterloo when Napoleon said whoever controls the farmhouse wins the battle. Is it is it that serious? Is 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 that why we're having this conversation because well, there are all kind of implications that go way beyond just those of the interest of the neuroscientist and philosopher. Um, if we are just our brains, if it's true that mental states are brain states, then there are implications for free will. Mm -hmm. um, are we just our brains? And if so, do we just do what our brains tell us? And if so, what are the implications for moral responsibility? Can anyone be held morally responsible for any action if it's not actually coming from them, it's coming mm. from forces beyond their control? Mm. But we don't seem to live in that kind of world. We seem to live as though people live as though their choices mean something and yeah. we fight for our rights and the rights of other people precisely because we're not just packs of neurons, we're conscious beings who Fantastic. live meaningfully. There are implications for AI, implications for ethics, I could say yeah. more about that. But, yeah, well, I mean, feel free um, to circle back to that. Yeah. But Emily, do you want to respond to what you've heard so far and give your give your feelings and, and thoughts? Yeah. So Speak from the mind. It certainly does feel to us like we have a mind that is distinct from our brain. Um, we, we've, we've always been aware of ourselves as thinking conscious creatures as far back as philosophical reflection goes. But as we learn more and more about the brain, we learn that there are certain areas of the brain that do certain things. Um, and also when you injure certain parts of the brain, you undergo significant changes in personality and capability, etc. So it's clear at the very least there's a strong and profound connection between the sorts of things we experience, the qualia, the thoughts, the emotions and the physical brain that sits in our heads. I mean, there's somebody who you discuss in your book and who comes up a lot in these kinds of conversations known as Phineas Gage, who um, was uh, around 200 years ago, 150 years ago, and experienced an accident where a pole, uh, th there was an explosion and a pole uh, went through his eye socket and through his brain and caused significant damage. And now what happened to Phineas is he lost whatever it was, according to the stories, that made him him, his personality changed. He stopped being able to hold down a job. His personal relationships broke down. There was something fundamentally about who he was that was changed because of damage to the brain. And we know this with patients who uh, undergo lobotomies and also something much more mun not mundane every day. You know, people take medication for psychiatric disorders, for mental illness. So there is clearly a deep connection between the mind and the brain. And so I guess my question to you is, the question you asked me, what is the mind and, and how can we be sure that it is something distinct from the brain when we know that physical impacts on the brain have yeah. profound consequences on the mind? Yeah, absolutely. I actually agree with you on that. And I think that that's partly why we have this conversation and why many neuroscientists have sought to find more holistic ways of describing the mind-brain relationship precisely because of the close correlation that we see. One of my postdocs was in um, study of human cocaine abuse. You know, we put someone in an MRI scanner and mm. you give them cocaine, which generates a certain experience. You see networks lighting up in the brain. Of course, yeah. these two things are connected. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face as a uh, society is how we care for an aging population because we have people whose brains are in a state of degeneration with very clear impact on the mind and the personality uh, of the person. Yeah. There's a question there that was as, uh, about personhood. If, if there's a person that's beyond their brain, then even if the brain changes, is there still a person there? And that's, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why this question is so important. But the thing that I find to be really helpful and really interesting is that the science gets you to connection. You know, the, all of the examples you've just quoted and the ones I've given say that the mind and brain are connected, but the scientific data doesn't enable you to establish the nature of that connection or the relationship. For that, you have philosophy. Mm. But the science doesn't get you to philosophy, which is why it's very frustrating to, to read sometimes in scientific journals an interpretation. For example, the, the front cover of Scientific American in 2017 talked about how the mind arises, very enticing title. And then underneath it said, network interactions in the brain create thought. 
Mm. As if some scientific study has shown that network interactions in the brain create thought, but there's actually no study you can do that will enable you to draw that conclusion. The study will have been that networks in the brain correlate with certain aspects of thought, but not that it cr one creates the other. That's a philosophical assumption or interpretation mm. that's been imposed upon the data. And we see this happening all the time in all kinds of areas and in this area of mind and brain. So the science doesn't get you to the nature of the connection. It simply says the two are correlated. So yeah. then we have the question, what is the best way of making sense of how these things are related? But that's not from science, that's from philosophy and theology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is there are fundamental limitations to science and we have to recognize that. Um, but just because science can't tell us the nature of the connection between mind and brain, or at least it can't demonstrate that physical processes and mental processes are the same thing. That in and of itself doesn't give you any evidence that that's not the case either. So you, I think you're right. We have to look to philosophy. Yeah. yeah. I think qualia give you a good reason to believe that that's not the case, that qu conscious experience is, is not the same thing as the, the processes that are involved. You know, when you experience pain that's you know we can describe that physically but the experience is not is not the underlying processes there are two things happening there I spoke well I suppose that's the open pain. question isn't it because I would I would say that they probably are the same thing but it's just one of them gives you an experience of what it's like in a scientific sense and the other is what that feels like what that physical process feels like to the person I don't I don't think that there we have to say that because you can feel, I mean, we, you know, we feel, we can feel physical pain. We can give a physical explanation for it. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think that the, um, the fact that it has an impact on us necessarily shows that there are two separate things going on. Um, I think we probably can at some point give a physical explanation for all of it, just because we aren't able to right now. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we will in the future, or at least could in principle, even if there are limitations to what science could tell us, mm. there is an explanation in principle there. I wonder if psychologists might take you to task on that a little Maybe. bit because, <laughs> I mean, you know, if you want to access what's in someone's mind, you need to ask them. You can't simply measure their brain. Well, you know, we, we can't at the moment, but science uh, science isn't finished. We don't have perfect technical capabilities. So maybe we could at some point, maybe, I, I don't know. I, mm. Again, I think that's something that I want to remain agnostic on, but I think we should be careful not to say that because we can't do it now, because our brain imaging technology isn't there now, it couldn't ever be. But I, I, just to respond, By I think means. that actually underlying that is the assumption that it has a physical basis mm. that can be objectively measured. But even now, um, the, you know, the fields of psychiatry and psychology are the only way they proceed and function um, to the maximum is, is if the, 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 the patient or the volunteer is asked about their experiences. There are some aspects of our humanity that can't be objectively measured in an, an empirical scientific sense. Mm. And that's why we're even having this conversation. If I wanted to do a study of what it's like for you to write your next book, and I set, you know, put an EEG cap on you and put you in an MRI scanner and measure the data from your brain, is that gonna tell me what it's like for you to go through that process? No, it's not. No. And so we need access to a different category of information. In order to access your mind, we can't measure your brain. Mm. And that, for me, and for many uh, philosophers, um, puts that in a completely different category. Conscious experience and brain processes are two fundamentally different things. And one is not synonymous with the other. I wonder if we're talking... Uh, if you'd like me to go out for a bit, you guys seem really happy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think we might be confusing uh, questions of epistemology with questions of ontology. So questions about knowledge and understanding with questions about the way that things are in themselves. I, I agree that there are two different types of explanation going on, which is the epistemic point, that we explain mental processes and physical processes differently. I think we can't go from the epistemic point to the ontological or metaphysical point that those two things are different because we explain them differently. I think, I think that's where the argument breaks down for me. But for, for me, it's actually that we experience one and we measure the other. Yeah, okay, so... And so I think that that... that yeah. Can I just say, is it, is, it, is it fine now I'm uh, 
watching this wonderful non-fatal sparring match between the two of you. But it, it's great. We've got areas of convergence, areas of divergence, but a, a wonderful sort of gentility towards one another. Is it fair to say that th at the moment the best we have is the sort of um, mappe mundi, the sort of old, you know, like old maps of the world? And the closer you are to home, the easier it is to map out the landscape. But the further away you get the more obscure and sort of gratuitous some of the maps become. It, is that the case with what we're talking about here? We've got some observable points, some navigable points, but there's actually a lot of uncharted territory, which you're yeah. thinking presumably we will start to chart as we, as we go along. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And um, we may also be fundamentally limited in how much we can come to understand the brain. I remember hearing a quote, and I, I can't remember who said it, but it was, if the human brain was simple enough for us to understand, we would be too simple to understand it. Mm. So maybe um, the brain coming to understand itself is just one of those things that science will never be able to, yeah. to tell us. And of course, we might draw different conclusions from that. I might say, well, there is in principle a physical explanation for what's going on in the brain, but we havers of these brains can't get there and you might say well that's because we can't give a physical explanation for everything that goes on in the mind would that be fair to say um i think that i think fundamentally where i'm coming from is that simply looking at human beings through the lens of their brain gives you a diminished view of what it means to be a human being that we are more than just neurons and there are more than physical explanations in this world and in reality and we need to access those into, in order to have the most holistic view mm. of what a human being is and therefore we need to draw not just from neuroscience but also from um, you know from the clinic from, from theology from philosophy from and actually when you start to look at patients things get really interesting um, you know you've got um, patients who um, have recovered from childhood hydroencephaly who are missing 95 percent of their cortex mm. and yet function normally as adults or you've got um, well we've got the near-death experiences that we Which will get to, to come to. yeah Alm almost imminently yes or or we have um, things like psychosomatic illness where there mm. are illnesses that are born in the mind that have no organic cause or very no detectable organic cause as far as we know fascinating things when you look at actual people mm. neurons are not enough to expect I'm not I'm not I'm not diminishing the neuroscience I mm. was one uh, and I loved my research but on its own to make sense of human beings I don't believe it's enough well I don't I think there is actually a difference between saying that you are a physicalist and that neurons explain everything mm -hmm. so there's there's an emerging field uh, known as embodied cognition which talks about the the or I guess it's trying to unpick this idea that the brain can explain everything. It says cognition actually extends beyond the brain. We are fundamentally embodied. We can't understand the whole of human experience just by talking about the brain. But the body is still physical. So I do think that there's a different... I think it might be a bit too reductive to say that everything about the human is, our, is neurons. And I don't want to endorse that position. But I do think that we could probably at some point, or at least there's an in principle physical explanation of everything. And maybe embodied cognition is one of the ways that we can move towards a more holistic understanding of the human person that still doesn't propose this kind of ghost in the machine, this mm, yeah. disembodied soul yeah. living in the body and somehow well, causing well, things move, to happen. Let's move I in that direction. That, and, and actually, um, I, I don't want to uh, imply that the only alternative view to what we've talked about is that, because actually there are other forms of looking at the mind-brain relationship that offer a more holistic and actually I love the word embodied because yeah. actually the Christian perspective on human beings is that they are embodied yeah. beings and so yeah that's well very let's, important. let's use that as a segue into what we want to talk about part of the topic of the conversation is near-death experiences and we've talked about the mind and the brain I don't want to be the cook that spoils the broth but can I introduce the word soul into that. Please now, do. <laughs> uh, Julien Offray de la Maitrie said that the soul is an empty word to which no idea corresponds. So we can, we can speak to that and we'll start now and again we'll carry on after the break. But you use this word embodied and obviously near-death experiences, we want to talk about the history, what counts as one and, and, and where they come from. But this idea of a near-death experience presumably has something to do with 
uh, a disembodied experience which is not located in the mind not located in in the brain Sharon can you just start to unpack that for us well I think that um one of the assumptions around a physicalist position, whether it is embodied cognition or a reductive approach, is that the mind is still tied to the physical brain. And so when the brain dies, conscious awareness and uh, the mind dies with it. Um, but it seems to be that um, since the 1970s, um, with res since resuscitation technologies became available, there have become um, a patient, there seem to arise patients who have been in a state of clinical death who, when were revived, started to tell stories about being conscious during this experience. And there's an example that goes back as early as 1943 um, from someone called George Ritchie, who's a medical student who ended up getting severe pneumonia. And at the time, they didn't have many antibiotics. So he, he actually died. He was dead for nine minutes. And then um, someone persuaded the attendant doctor to inject adrenaline. He, he actually revived. And... Um, he went on to describe a very vivid experience that he then wrote about. And then when he qualified as a doctor, began to share it with his medical students and some of those got fascinated. And, and so people then began to systematically investigate this phenomenon of when you are in a state of clinical death, um, where there is no cardiac signal and in some cases, no detectable EEG signal, no brainstem signal. Patients are reporting being vividly conscious. And what do we do with this data? Is it evidence that um, the mind can exist w without the body? Um, what I want to say, probably at the offset, is that I don't see it as a proof of heaven. I don't, I'm not resting all of my kind of... Uh, beliefs on this particular phenomenon but it's certainly interesting and it's particularly um, baffling if you are just your brain uh, but of course I know there are kind of various critiques of it um, but is it evidence of that there's more than just our brains that there's a non-physical realm it's it's a fascinating data set so help us with that distinction again what counts as a near-death experience? What is classified as an NDE? Just go over that again for us. Well, so one of the, um, there are a number of features actually, and one of the things that's quite persuasive about them is that these features seem to be very consistent across many uh, patients um, from different cultures and of different beliefs as well. So some key features are um, uh, being kind of out of their body and having a perspective on what's happening with some details that can be corroborated um, in also uh, not being confined to the limitations of their physical body. Um, there's no pain anymore from whatever they were um, needing to be operated on, that the pain is gone. Um, talk about a, a being of light uh, and which... Um, this is where different people of different beliefs uh, interpret this being of light differently and they might bring their religious beliefs to bear on that being. Um, but nevertheless, in each case, there's a being of light in some way that interacts with them. Some people talk about um, seeing deceased relatives and uh, communicating with them. Um, and then others also, uh, another key feature is perception of a border, that there's a point beyond which if they cross that it's the point of no return mm -hmm. and then there's um, a return of a life review where they they actually review uh, are shown their life back to them and they uh, become aware of things they did and said and um, and then there's a, um, a return to the body um, which often is against their will because mm -hmm. they were actually preferring um, this disembodied state and then the final feature is a life transformation some actually undergo mm. a dramatic change uh, in how they live their life and their per their kind of purpose and meaning has has changed and shifted and these features are actually common to all NDEs I think or, or certainly lots, um, of, them, lots of them not and I think NDEs are are rated on the number of these different features that, that make up any given person's NDE. That's wonderful. Well, we have reached a near-break experience, and there's lots to talk about in the final section. It's not 
the point of no return. We are coming back from this. We are talking, and it's spectacular. Thank you so much for the substantive and uh, supremely good conversation we're having. I feel so privileged to be witnessing it as well as to be moderating it. So we are talking today on The Big Conversation about the mind, consciousness, and near-death experiences. Are NDEs proof of an afterlife? Join us for the final section shortly where we will... We will solve this problem once and for all. Are you enjoying the conversation? Why don't you tell us who persuaded you in our survey? Plus, if you want more from today's conversation, register now and you'll receive the e-book of Sharon Dirks and Ian McGilchrist debating brain science and God. Welcome back to this third and final part of The Big Conversation featuring my guests Sharon Dirks and Emily Qureshi Hurst. And today we have been discussing and are continuing to discuss the mind, consciousness and near-death experiences, our NDEs, proof of an afterlife. And we may have to disagree on this, but that, that's okay because, you know, there's method in the madness and iron sharpens iron and all of that. So that is really good. We talked for a long time about the mind and the brain. I then threw a complete spanner in the works by mentioning the soul emily as 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 a as an atheist mm. what do you think when you hear people talking about the soul is it a helpful fiction is it something that you think should be completely disregarded because i think there are the there are these phrases that we use in sort of common parlance people say follow your heart or go with your gut we're not really telling people to yeah. just do that so how do you feel and how would you respond when someone says oh my soul hurts or that's my soul mate or anything mm. what is a soul for you as an atheist i think it's rich with symbolic meaning and i think we all know what somebody's talking about when they talk about a soul mate or soul food or that nourishes my soul i think it's a beautiful metaphor mm. and i don't think it's any more than that okay sharon Ah, I think that soul um, varies depending on who you're talking to. In the context of our current conversation, some might see it as synonymous with mind, whatever that inner reality is that some people think is distinct from the physical brain. It's that. Um, uh, theologically, uh, it depends who you ask. There, there are those that w would say that the soul is the, that which integrates the mind and the will um, and that kind of inner, inner self. What we definitely don't want to say, and when oft often we think of soul, we might go back to ancient Greece and think about Plato as this kind mm -hmm. of immaterial uh, but eternal, um, immortal part of the person that one day floats off to heaven, mm -hmm. which is particularly unhelpful when we kind of think about, you know, neuroscience, which seems to show kind of mind and body or body and soul to be so integrated mm. actually christian theology offers a very different view and a, a hebrew notion of soul is very embodied and very holistic for example in genesis 2 verse 7 when it talks about god creating a human being he talks about creating the man from the dust of the earth breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and the hebrew where there is neshama or ruach which is breath of life or life force or spirit, the product of that is a living nefesh, which is the Hebrew word for soul. So soul in a Christian context is actually not some immaterial part of you that floats off to heaven. Indeed, heaven is not immaterial. It's physical and spiritual. Um, and so whatever it is, it's embodied mm. and holistic, which agrees with everything that we've been saying so far about any persuasive argument for what a human being is needs to match those criteria. So from your point of view, Sharon, do NDEs, and we're talking about best guesses here, do they signpost towards the truth of theism or Christian theism more than they point towards atheism? And we'll let Emily respond. But from yeah. your point of view... Yeah, I think that if the accounts are accurate and if people are actually um, have genuinely had these experiences and it seems that they have and we can talk about the kinds of evidence and how reliable that is um, then that gives us pause for thought in in line of the view that the physical mechanism of the mechanisms of the brain drive and determine the person um, because it, you know if 
there is a subset of data where there is no, sig no detectable signal from the brain uh, in the cortex or in the brainstem, and yet the person is vividly conscious. Mm. Um, and so I think that we have to wrestle with these kind of data sets that mm. surely point us to, at the very least, that human beings are complex, that when you start to look at people, you see a more complex, more rich tapestry than simply when you look at data in a laboratory or indeed, um, you know, ideas in philosophy. And so um, I, I think it deserves to be looked at. There's now 50 years of research, um, you know, dozens and dozens of studies from clinicians who have no interest in gaining a reputation mm. in this area, from people who have actually changed their position based on their near-death experience. So one example would be Eben Alexander, who was a former Harvard neurosurgeon, who was a strict physicalist, and his patients upon resuscitation used to tell him they'd had NDEs, and he would dismiss them, because if you don't have a functioning cortex, you can't be conscious, until he himself developed severe bacterial meningitis at the age of 54 and went into a coma and was not expected to survive all of his neocortex had shut down his family were told to put their affairs in order um, because he wasn't going to make it and yet extraordinarily he pulled through somehow and then went on to describe a very vivid um, near-death experience incl which included meeting a sister that he never knew he would had that had died before he'd had a chance to meet her and then when he was shown a photo of her it exactly matched the person mm. he went on to become a dualist he's not a christian but um he dramatically changed his view and actually why would you do that mm. in mm. a very physicalist neurosurgery environment where everyone else is a physicalist why would you do that unless something happened to you that you consider to be genuine and real so yeah. those kinds of things are fascinating to me when yeah. people undergo position changes based mm. on their experience. That well, gives me thought. That's great. Well, let's ask Emily ab about that then, because at least on the surface, as Sharon herself said, it, it's not proof of heaven. It's not proof of a, proof of the truth of mm. Christianity. But it does seem to slightly undermine materialism and naturalism. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe so <not. laughs> come on then. Well, I I think that these experiences are clearly extremely significant for the people that have them. I don't doubt their credibility in terms of what was experienced by the individual. But I think we need to be really careful about what we do with that information, or what we do with that data mm -hmm. set, as you called it. So one of the things that I would like to mention first is that when we're looking at different types of evidence, the most unreliable is what philosophers call per first person experience mm -hmm. and what the courtroom will call eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. We know that we are notoriously fallible. We remember things incorrectly. There have been studies about um, looking at what people can remember from uh, scenes of crashes and all of that sort of stuff. And our memories are not very reliable in those environments, particularly when we're under a lot of stress. So I think we need to be careful about what we do with this information. We need to view it with a healthy amount of skepticism, I think. And also, I, I would like to say that when we're talking about uh, near-death experiences, clearly there has been no death. Mm -hmm. This person, these people haven't died. We know that death is reversible, is irreversible, sorry. So even if there's no detectable activity in the brain, that doesn't mean there was no activity in the brain. Our instruments are not perfect. So there could have been a lot of stuff going on. It's definitely possible that people mm -hmm. could be seeming to be completely unconscious, but actually aware of what was going on around them. So this mm -hmm. idea of floating up out of your body and watching things happen and being able to describe it afterwards, that could be formed in your imaginative mind, almost like a dream from things that you hear going on around you. I mean, it's a, perhaps a silly example, but when I was younger, I had a very, very vivid dream that me and my friend, who's a songwriter, were writing a song. And I remember waking up thinking, wow, that song was incredible. I need to write it down, I don't want to lose it. And then I realized that it was playing on the radio. And so I thought that I had this experience that I was writing this song and that it was coming from me and it was mine. And actually my mind was forming images, experiences mm. out of the auditory information that I was, that was going into my brain that I yeah. wasn't really yeah. aware of. So I, I do think that it's possible that these descriptions people give of what yeah. doctors did to them could be formed out of this auditory information that they have being built into something mm -hmm. uh, that forms into a more coherent picture as they wake up like when you wake up and you form the narratives out of your dreams. Mm. So 
it's fascinating, fascinating mm. stuff. But I do think we need to view it with, as I said, a healthy amount mm. of scepticism. Yeah. A well, I agree maybe. we need to bring scientific rigor to it. Yes. And, and, but what's fascinating about it is it seems that spiritual realities are now being observed in a clinical context and that's why some you know clinicians have given it time and have been surprised and one of the the things that has been notable is the consistency across uh, different testimonies that people have that are these common elements that we listed earlier are across all kinds of people from different cultures with different religious beliefs there's something about the consistency that means that actually maybe it's not as unreliable as we thought um, and it's, and not actually a knock, it's not a knockdown zinger for Christianity either, is it? Because you no, have people certainly from, not, no. from, from different <laughs> worldviews well, experiencing yes. what they would say is yes. you know, their God or their and avatar. Yeah. Or yes, and actually, you know, your example about dreaming, in order to dream you have a functioning brain, but we do have to be real here that these... These are people who, whose brain is shutting down. She, yeah, I but agree, not shut down. I agree there's no de- detectable signal and we need to actually exercise caution that, you know, if in, in time the technology improves that signal can be detected. But nevertheless, there's a discontinuity between the lucid consciousness that people have in these situations compared with the, the, the sort of disordered state of their brain, which is in the process of dying there's a disproportionality there that needs explanation. Their brain is shutting down, but they are more of it, more awake, more alive, and more free than ever. How do we make sense of that? On the point of eyewitness testimony, I feel you do a discredit to the whole discipline of history, which rests on eyewitness testimony. There's no way that a historian can access the event itself unless they rely on this. People are sent to the electric chair. People's whole lives and destinies are determined on the basis of eyewitness yeah. testimony. There is such a thing as reliable eyewitness testimony. That's the basis of the Gospels are considered reliable as well. Yeah, and well, so we, do, we need to be really careful about that because there are, there are cases where people have misidentified suspects in certain, uh, saying this person was there when they weren't. Um, there are we we miss things in in our uh, visual perception mm. all the time. So it is an it is notoriously fallible, and yeah. so we. I'm not trying to do a disservice to the whole discipline of history, but I am trying to say we need in the courtroom, for example, we need to take these things with a pinch yeah. of salt. And so you know when somebody is in a state of trauma, when they as you say their brain is shutting down, they've got lots of medication in their system. Maybe what they're reporting is not as reliable uh, as you know we might uh, as what we are seeing mm. right now and I, i'd also like to push back on this idea that there's complete agreement in near-death experiences actually the figures that people see when and interact with are often very very culturally informed so christians will report seeing jesus and hindus will report seeing gods from their particular faith so actually in in my view that undermines the idea that there is some that god is communicating with you mm-hmm. in these moments and actually what what's happening these are visions of a from a dying brain and you're filling in uh, your own cultural expectations mm-hmm. into those experiences mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think i suppose my point is that the fact that they're experiencing anything at all mm. is noteworthy. Um, so I let, let's, that let's use that to make some concluding statements. And you, you've both yeah. expounded and exposited your views, respective views, so lucidly and beautifully. So the question is, in, in the last couple of minutes, we want to sort this out. Do near-death experiences offer proof of an afterlife? Maybe... Emily, you would say no, if it's no. a one-word answer. <laughs> Sharon, and I'm going to give you time to unpack that a bit more, or at least give a concluding statement. Might you say, Sharon, well, no, they don't, they don't offer proof, but they might offer an inference to the best explanation. Yeah, I would say that um, I'm, not, I'm not expecting near-death experiences to offer proof of, of heaven. I also agree that they're in, uh, the brain in a state of approaching death, not final full biological mm. death itself. However, if we are just our brains, um, they pose more of a challenge to interpret. Mm. Uh, arguably, they're impossible. 
um, if, if, if there's truly no detectable signal in the brain, um, then they're a complete anomaly if we are just our brains. If God exists, then we already have within that framework that there is a non-physical realm. The whole conversation about how that interacts with the brain normally is, is one that we haven't been able to have, but um, there's a non-physical realm. And so we have a framework for making sense of these, that we are more than just our bodies and brains, that we are physical and non-physical, arguably spiritual beings in this life, and that there is a life to come. And the reason that we know that is because um, Jesus bodily rose from the dead uh, as the kind of forerunner of all who want to follow him, that, that is, the same will be true for them. Final word from you. So I don't think near-death experiences are proof of anything. They're absolutely fascinating and we should definitely do more work investigating them. We need better scientific tools to be able to do that. We need to be able to measure the brain much more accurately than we can measure it now. Our fMRI scanners are good, but they are definitely not uh, very, they, they can't measure the brain with a, a huge amount of fine, fine structure. So we need to, uh, I think we need to s suspend our judgment about what this means. And I think skepticism is the, the best way to view it. Fantastic. Well, we are now at the point of no return. Will we go on after this, after the cameras have shut down? Who's to say, but we will continue to uh, look into that. But it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much to Thank both you. of you. Thank Sharon's you. book, Am I Just My Brain, is uh, amazing and worth getting. Emily's book, your first book. I it is, yep. God, Salvation and the Problem of Space Time is also fantastic, worth reading and worth getting. Uh, You've been wonderful guests. Thank you so much. We've talked today on The Big Conversation about the mind, consciousness, and near-death experiences. Are NDEs proof of an afterlife? Well, maybe not, but um, there may be something in them. Anyway, my name's Andy Kind. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. If you want even more from today's conversation, register now, and you'll receive the ebook of Sharon Dirick's and Ian McGilchrist's Big Conversation on Brain Science and God. And tell us what you thought in our survey with today's show.